sometimes in speak of the devotional is a little bit long or maybe a little bit more than I have time to record so what I'd like to do is just maybe share this one it's a long one if it's long sometimes I try to skip them or adapt them but this one seems to I don't know what's going to say completely but the title was interesting so I'll try to read through this and share it with you and see if God may be speaking to both of us through it. So if there's not much commentary, praise the Lord, aren't you glad? (laughs) When you're looking for evidence of genuine faith, what are the marks of true Christianity? Look around you. Listen. You will see or hear of Christians who are leaving their wives, divorcing their husbands, turning their backs on truth they once professed. As Christian psychiatrist in a major city was accused of molesting one of his patients, a young boy, upon close investigation, pictures were discovered that showed him practicing and participating in sexual acts with a number of different boys. The community was stunned. The family was in total shock. The man was a pillar in his church and his community. Had it not been for the pictures, they probably never would have believed the accusations that had been made. What happened? How could a person who professed to believe in Jesus Christ ever live such a lifestyle? Have you heard of people who at one time had a zeal for God, were excited about the Word of God, just couldn't get enough of Christianity, and then they walked away from it? Are you ever confused when you see people who are brought up under the Word of God run away from it? And what about those who get caught up in the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of riches and all of a sudden don't have time for the things of God? Can a person who is truly saved as a habit of life where Jesus would never walk, can a person say that he or she doesn't believe the Bible anymore and still be saved? Basically, according to the Word of God, there are seven ways that you can tell the professors, those who merely name the name of Christ, from the possessors, those who are truly indwelt by him, who know him. True Christianity brings forth lasting fruit the evidence of salvation. So it's time we did some fruit inspecting. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go forth and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain. John 15, 16. The first fruit that gives evidence of a genuine faith is a person's walk. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. 1 John 1, 6. A real Christian walks in light, not in darkness. A real Christian walks the way Jesus walked. A real Christian orders his or her behavior accordingly. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought also to walk in the same manner as he walked. 1 John 2, 5 and 6. Jesus is the light of the world. He did not walk in darkness. Therefore, neither can those who are his true followers. Jesus said, I have come as light into the world, so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. John 12, 46. The second evidence of genuine faith is an outgrowth of the first. A real Christian does not live in habitual sin. Oh yes, we do sin, 1 John 2, 1 through 2, 1 and 2. But it is no longer the habit in our lives. True Christians walk in obedience to his commandments. This is not to say that we don't disobey them from time to time but it will not be the habit of our lives. It's not something we want to do. To not obey his commandments is to be lawless, and sin is lawlessness, 1 John 3, 4. You know that you have appeared, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins, present tense in the Greek. Therefore, it implies continuous or habitual action. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. 1 John 3, 5, 6, 8 and 9. The third evidence of genuine faith is a continual perseverance in faith. Can a person be saved and then at some point turn around and walk away from what he or she professed as clearly set forth in the Word of God? The Bible speaks clearly of antichrists, those who seek to usurp the place of Jesus in the life of the believer and in doing so to lead them astray from the faith. 
Children, it is the last hour, and just as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know this is the last hour. 1 John 2.18 And what about those who follow such teachings that are contrary to the Word of God? Jesus tells us they were never really true believers. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out, so that they should be shown what they were not of us. 1 John 2.19 The fruit of true Christianity is perseverance in the faith. Beloved, true believers do not permanently stray away from God. Also, a Christian cannot help but love others. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us, Romans 5.5. 5. This is the fourth evidence of genuine faith, that we love one another. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death, 1 John 3.14. Because love is an attribute of God and because a Christian is a person who is indwelt by God, then it is only logical that love would be a fruit that a child of God would bear. John emphasizes this in his short epistle, making it clear that if there is no love for others, then you are not his. Watch how he uses the word no. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whosoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. 1 John 5, 1 and 2. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 1 John 3.15 The fifth evidence of genuine faith is it life that overcomes the world. A true Christian is not overcome by the world. Instead, because Christ is in us, and because he, by the Holy Spirit, enables us to keep his commandments, we are able to overcome the world. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. 1 John 5.3 Note this, it is so essential... It is not a burden for a believer to walk in righteousness and to be obedient. We may fail now and then, but it should never be because it is a burden. If we fail, it is because we have chosen to walk by the flesh rather than by the Spirit. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. 1 John 5, 4, 5. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one, but praise God that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 1 John 5, 19, 4 and 4. The sixth evidence of genuine faith is the inward witness of the Spirit of God, testifying that he resides within. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his Spirit. And while this fruit may seem totally subjective, it is not. For if a person says that he has a witness of the Spirit in his heart, he will also have all the other evidences of salvation that we have already mentioned. These manifestations of genuine Christianity will be evident at one degree or another throughout the Christian sojourn here on earth. As you meditate on these truths, beloved, what is God saying to your own heart? What's he speaking to you? How does it apply to you? Or is he laying someone on your heart for prayer? What is your relationship to the Word of God? How well do you understand it? What is life like without it? Can you live without the Bible? What would it be any difference if the government took away your Bible? Or let me put it another way. Have you ever wondered why people would risk their jobs, their freedom, their relationship with their loved ones, even the very lives for the Word of God? This happened for years behind the Iron Curtain and is still happening today in countries around the world. Why? Why is the Word more precious than freedom? Because when within the soul of every child of God, there's a spiritual craving a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Man does not live by word alone, bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Deuteronomy 8.3 In the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Once the Holy Spirit moves in a person's heart, convicting of sin, righteousness, and judgment, there is awakening of a thirst for righteousness, a longing to be finished with sin and its awful harvest. Then, when in salvation the Holy Spirit takes up his residence within a child of God, the Spirit causes him to set his mind on the things of the Spirit. Romans 8, 1-8 It is the Spirit of God within us that enables us to understand the things of God. This is one of the ways you know that you are truly born again. You have a hungering and thirsting for righteousness that drives you to the Word of God. And when you get there, you find that you can understand it. The veil comes off when Christ comes in. And it happens because of the indwelling spirit. 
As it is written, every eye hath, or, eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man that which is, which is within him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 9-12 Have you ever wondered why, before you were saved, the Bible seemed so boring and hard to understand, and after you were saved, you couldn't get enough? Finally, you could understand it, and it is interesting and exciting. Now you understand it, don't you? Without God's Spirit inside, we cannot understand the things of God. In fact, to the natural unsaved man or woman, the things of the Spirit of God are foolishness. 1 Corinthians 2.14 This is the seventh evidence of genuine faith. You can tell the saved from the lost because the saved are hungry for his word and his righteousness. Are you just awed to the mystery of salvation? One minute a person is lost, the next minute he or she is, she is saved? You don't see anything spectacular or mysterious, mysterious taking place, and yet all of a sudden the person is a brand new creature in Christ Jesus, indwelt by the Spirit of God because he has been born again. And when he is, his life begins to evidence these seven good fruits. Uh, one, a Christian walks in light, following in the footsteps of Jesus. Two, a Christian does not walk in darkness, living in habitual sin. Three, a Christian does not permanently stray from God, but perseveres in the faith. Four, a Christian loves other people. Five, a Christian walks in righteousness, overcoming the world. Six, a Christian has the witness of the Holy Spirit in his heart. And seven, a Christian hungers for his word and his righteousness. These things I have written unto you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John 5.13 And while this may have been an extremely long devotional, you can replay the tape and watch it and read I would say take moments of time to think about it because it's deep. It's all of 1 John contained into a very small package and it's challenging. It's hard to comprehend all at once. But it is meat. And that's probably, in a nutshell, the sum and total of what any theology should be. If you want to know theology, read 1 John. If you want to get all of hermeneutic into one little tiny package replay this tape <laughs> that was probably the most condensed version i have ever seen in a long time and you know what it was accurate and it's something to think about